afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really uh, great to speak about those things in actually Eastern Europe, because usually <laughs> I was invited to speak about it in Western Europe. Or So uh, I think part of this ongoing discussion is also to form this kind of multitude of voices within this region. Um, and uh, I don't know if you, have sh if you share this experience, but growing up in Poland, I very much felt that the Europe is, the real Europe is somewhere else. That where we are growing up is kind of Europe B, and our role is to aspire to the Europe A. And uh, I guess now, also with wonderful talk of Madina, we also see that actually this inter-imperial condition that you have also been submitted to different kinds of regimes, it, it can be also enriching in some sense and, and enabling to form a voice from within the Europe B, so to say, outside of the validation of the West. I think here in Prague we are outside of the validation of the West. So I will share with you um, actually an article that is validated by the West because it has been published on the website of MoMA last year. Uh, together, a research I did together with the sociologist Jan Sova that also led to an exhibition at Savi Contemporary in Berlin 2017, in La Colonie in Paris 2019. Um, so a little bit of theory, but I mostly speak as a curator from situated, let's say, Central European perspective, and I will walk you through three projects which engage with those topics from curatorial point of view, and this will be those exhibitions in, um, that I mentioned, the Polish pavilion, uh, Polish Romani pavilion at the Venice Biennial, and the Autostrada Biennial in Kosovo. Uh, and uh, Kosovo is also another uh, side of Eastern Europe. Um, so I'm starting with this slide that is actually not a, it's a screenshot uh, of a Zoom conversation. I guess we all know this situation, and mostly in the pandemic, this is from 2021. This is, at this time, I was curating an exhibition in Riga, so I was very often on Zoom with Riga, but every time uh, the organizers in Riga scheduled a Zoom, it was written that the meeting is taking place in Helsinki. So, because it's a Helsinki time zone. So I started a little bit to observe also, if you schedule a Zoom in Kosovo or in other places, which cities appear in those Zooms. Um, so let me read a uh, conclusion. In the endless Zoom calls, one has to navigate the time zones. Setting your meeting to CET, Central European Time, you see many cities listed, including Amsterdam, Stockholm, and Rome, but almost never Tirana or Warsaw, which are part of the former Eastern Bloc. If you schedule a call in Riga, Helsinki comes up as your time mark. And it's not only the tech giants in Silicon Valley who see Europe through a Western prism, but also many critical thinkers dealing with the idea of those Eurocentric or US-grounded race theory. What is the place of East Europe in post-colonial and decolonial debate and in the larger colonial project? How to tackle the region that has been both oppressed, having endured centuries of serfdom, for example, and of course imperialism also, and now, actually in Poland, now we go through the peasant, what is called the peasant term, understanding these very long consequences of serfdom. And an op uh, so centuries of serfdom and imperialism, and then on the other hand, an op being an oppressor, aspiring to join the West in the colonization process, and lastly, of today, often quoting post-colonial theory in the national nationalist agenda. Um, something that wants to be but cannot, that wants to express itself but is unable to, wrote Witold Gombrowicz about Poland. Witold Gombrowicz, an amazing writer who actually left on the transatlantic in 39 just for a couple of weeks to Argentina, but then the, third, the Second World War broke and he never returned. So he spent so many years in Argentina, which also reflected on this, on what I would call the Europe B, because when you go, I went to Argentina at the beginning of the year and realized this connection that with the Latin, uh, in the Latin America of like also aspiring to be Europe, not be part of it, right? right? Wanting to wanting to be Europe. And from this perspective, Gombrowicz wrote also about this condition of Central Europeanness. While Maria Janion, a fem feminist, fantastic feminist, the author of Uncanny Slavdom, writes about Central Europe, a space torn between the feeling of superiority and inferiority, both towards the West and as well as the East, claims feminist scholar Maria Janion in Uncanny Slavdom. 
This paradox mix of under and overestimation of its own importance fueled the recent right-wing turn in Eastern Europe, predominantly in Poland and Hungary. Its symbolics, built of myth of past grandeur, regional context, con uh, conquest, while denying its own colonial mindset, come from the fact that the region is obsessed with its own history by reluctant to critically examine it. I guess we see it uh, very much um, in Poland, for example, with this recreation of historical battles. It's like a huge, huge, I don't know how it's, if it's here in Czechia, also like this huge um, industry of embodying history. But this embodying history is never a critical examination. It could be so interesting if it would be embodying history in memory politics um, kind of way, you know, like critically. It's not. Uh, it's not like this. Polish right-wing government celebrated the, I mean, former government, because since yesterday the history has turned, Polish right-wing government celebrated the country exceptionalism and victimhood in order to sustain anti-emigration stance in what curators Ekaterina Degod and David Reeve called a perverse decolonization. It's an emancipative process gone wrong, but also bent to feed the rage of new transgressive nationalist appetites. I guess it can be also applied, and you said, mentioned, the perverse decolonization. Part of this perversion is also, I guess, how Putin employs his, his vocabulary towards Ukraine. Maria Todorova famously said in her 1997 book, Imagining the Balkans, that Western Europe is a standard that the rest has to position itself to. Eastern Europe was thus following the Western counterparts in its own violent colonial ambitions. One of the blind spots in the historical narrative is lack of recognition of this region colonial race overseas and its consequences in much needed anti-racist education today. Now shortly about serfdom. This is the map of, uh, of serfdom in 19th, 18th century. It, uh, disappeared in the Western Europe and persisted for three or four centuries uh, more in the Eastern Europe. Among the historical implications of defining Central Eastern Europe is the long-term existence of serfdom, a feudal, feudal form of forced dependence and oppression, which disappeared in Western Europe in the 14th through 16th centuries as an effect on economic transformation and peasant revolts. The scholar Jan Sova suggests that the Elbe River has, can be a symbolic border between the development of slavery and serfdom. East of Elbe, serfdom persisted till end of the 19th century. West of it, the slave trade was delegated overseas and developed through colonization and modernization. European capitalism, capitalism was thus built on various kinds of unfree labor inherent to both systems. And ironically, the Elbe once marked the border of Roman Empire and later that of Iron Curtain. So in a way, it's the same border, repeating in various regimes. Scholars such as Anibal Quijano, Immanuel Wallerstein, or Perry Anderson showed that in the early modern times, the southeastern part of European continent was integrated into the capitalist world economy, while the core of Western Europe was turning to predatory expansion overseas. A kind of internal colonial expansion happened in the East, served them, developed, and persisted in Eastern Europe till the end of the 19th century, turning the region into one of its first historically peripheral zones. In the 16th century, the Polish nobility, uh, nobility played a key role in further extending the system of serfdom into Ukraine and southeastern Europe. Poland's attempts to build its own empire by dominating Lithuania, annexing vast areas of today Ukraine and Belarus, are still described in the Polish language using the colonial term kresy, vast empty border territories. And one uh, cannot, should not forget the enslavement of the Romanian people persisted in Romania till the mid 19th century. Thus, Eastern Europe idiosyncrasy is that it shares the condition of being complicit in the system of imperialism and colonization, while at the same time serving as a first training ground for its implementation, being colonizer and colonized, rationalizing and rationalized. And now, three examples of how art and artists have dealt with this idiosyncrasies. First is Yannick Simon, an artist I've been working for a long time um, with, and his ongoing research since 2006 on the organization called Maritime and Colonial League and the history that never was. This is a very interesting photo. Uh, it is uh, from 1939. 
so just before the war, um, it's a photo from the demonstration for colonies. So the Poland should have colonies. It should um, invest even more. The, colonial, the Maritime and Colonial League was an organization founded in 1918 after the, after the, when the Poland regained independence. So it regained also access to Baltic Sea and with the access of Baltic Sea, it regained the idea of also following the West in having colonies. And so this means the strength of Poland lies in colonies. There have been one million members of this organization. It uh, was absolute an obsession, a, a crazy obsession, and there was even a very close collaboration with the German government and the discussion that, um, for example, Prussia was, um, the, um, was negotiating um, the, the colonial colonizing of Togo. And because of 1918, and because part of Poland was Prussia, now Poland also should have a share in this kind of, in, in the Togo territory. So it was a very complex, um, uh, actually closely related also with the Polish-German dialogue uh, investigation. Janek Simon research ongoing since 2006 consists of assembling counter archives of displaying and contextualizing magazines, other archival um, items in this period. What the artist's multi rayed and well-informed installation display is that the mindset and ideas propagated by Maritime and Colonial League linger till today. The history that never was, the road not taken, has direct link to latent racism and to some neo-colonial ideas such as Intermarium, is this Eastern European idea, Intermarium, geopolitical federation of Eastern European bloc countries led by Poland from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, uh, advocated by the current right-wing government. This is a... Um, installation from Ujazdowski Castle in 2019 and also from Sabi Contemporary. It's also an ongoing research that Yannick has been uh, doing. Also a long research on Madagascar and uh, terrible plans also of the um, relocating Jewish population of Eastern Europe to Madagascar. The second project I want to talk about is um, the, the Venice, the Polish uh, Romani Pavilion and the Venice Bainio last year also that uh, I had a huge honor to co-curate. Um, and before telling you about this pavilion, I just read something uh, from a Roma curator, Tima Junghaus. The inner European colony, according to Tima Junghaus, curator and executive director of the Roma Institute of Arts, ERIAC, Europeans like to look for colonies somewhere far and outside, but they fail to see the long-term inner colonized minority that has existed within Europe since the 14th century. The Romani are Europe's largest and oldest ethnic minority, counting more than 12 million people. This transnational, trans-European, Roman Sinti community manifesting no state-forming desires or territorial claims has long been present across Europe, especially in its central, eastern, and southern part. And that was also one of the starting points of, of that pavilion, um, sewn and, and done from the perspective of Małgorzata Mirgatas, um, an amazing artist living in uh, in Tatra Mountains near Zakopane in southern Poland. This is the pavilion. It was called the Re Reenchanting the World. Uh, it is, uh, draws inspiration from this palazzo. It's, it's also a, a, an example, I would say, of you know, the colonizing, in that case, art history through the Roman lands. Our starting point was this palazzo. It's a Palazzo Schipanoia in Ferrara. It's a very important re Renaissance palazzo, also because Abi Warburg, a German Jewish art historian, coined there some of the very mm, important for art history terms, such as Nachleben, life after life of images. So before in art history, there, was no, there, was, there wasn't an idea that an image is something that travels. Also, he spoke about Bilderfahrzeuge, so the images with, which travel. And that was one of the first places where Warburg came and look at these different characters that you can see here and you know, wrote that actually they are not originating from there. They must have traveled. They have made certain journey. And where do they come from? And he starts to trace their genealogy that this kind of motifs started in Persia, in, in India, and then went to Persia, and then to ancient Greece, and then to Rome, and then to the Renaissance, Italy. So this kind of idea of a travel and, and uh, of a meaning and symbols appeared there. Um, when we went there, actually that's the first thing, what is also important about this palazzo, it's like a zodiac walk-in. So what you can see here, 
are zodiac signs. Uh, from the right side, you see the Taurus, then Gemini, uh, Cancer. There are seven of them which are preserved, and others have been uh, eradicated because actually for many centuries it was kind of a tabak depot or something like that. So it was uh, discovered, rediscovered only in the 19th century. So um, we have looked at, the, at this palace and Małgorzata, and then together Małgorzata had her reading and together we thought, how, what does it mean to reread such a document of culture, so to say, and why would one reread it from the Roma perspective? And one of the reasons, I and mean, there were many, many reasons, but one of them is also the fact that as those images started to travel in the 14th century, uh, or before that, uh, but in 14th century they arrived to Europe, in the same moment, Roma population starts to travel from India and exits uh, India and comes to, to Europe. So in a way, this uh, very um, lived experience of how this largest European minority arrives uh, has been manifested or overlayered on this. Um, another aspect is, of course, the zodiac, the idea of telling the future, uh, of reading each other. Uh, uh, an amazing Roma scholar, Ethel Blux, she says that you know zodiac and the fact that tarot cards have been used by Roma population is is a way of psychoanalysis before psychoanalysis because it, the psychoanalysis also doesn't just come with Freud. It responds to longer vernacular human old human need that um, also Roma people very much contributed to. So we found different uh, ways of reading of this palazzo. We kept the zo the, the zodiac. Uh, the zodiac, the middle band, is the zodiac part. So the only thing really uh, picturally that was kept is uh, the Taurus uh, or the, the, the symbol of a given month. So this is month of April, uh, sorry, March, which is the first uh, month in the zodiac calendar because it starts with March. And those deities, uh, mysterious Greek deities, they have been replaced with what we call Maugojata zodiac, so different art and activists that lead her in her life, so very important other scholars or artists for her, it's a middle band. The lower band, this is um, everyday life in the court of Ferrara, Duke d'Este, and very kind of ego-oriented self-depiction of the court, which is replaced by this collective uh, vernacular way of making something happen. Uh, so this is kind of a very long piece of fabric that the group of women is replicating or um, working on together, Roma women in her settlements. But actually it's also about the fact of the colonizing art history because when we think about the technique, you know, it's a patchwork or it's a quilt, then you look at the an art history book. Who is the author of a patchwork or, you know, how the patchwork came into the art history? And then you re read about Picasso or Braque. Were Picasso and Braque the ones who invented patchworks? It was a way of, of course, like, you know, taking the very long-standing vernacular legacy of groups of very often women, like this, making something collectively, B uh, putting bits and pieces, repairing. It's also so much about repair, because all this actually has been made with second-hand clothing, and that's um, that we have bought um, shops around Zakopane. And that's another aspect of this Nachleben, because when you think about those fabrics, it's also life of afterlife of those fabrics. First of all, she's using fabrics. If she depicts a, per a particular person, if she would depict you, she would ask for a piece of your clothing. Because the, our clothes carry, of course, our energy and our sweat and our personality. So on one hand, you have a personal relation. And the nachleb, the life after life of this clothing. On the other hand, there is a life after life of many secondhand clothes. And then you start to think about the journey. And most of those clothes have been made in India or Bangladesh and traveled to Western Europe. And at one point, somebody in Western Europe was bored, bored with them. So they landed up in the second hub in Eastern Europe. So there is also the circularity of labor uh, written in this pavilion uh, and in this palace that Warburg, of course, only you know, symbolically analyzed. Um, and then the upper belt that also was part of it was also a documenta. It's um, based on a lithography and a very rare documents of arrival of Roma people to Europe from Jacques Callot, lithographies from 15th century that she also decolonizes because she kind of changes their derogatory perspective. Into. So on one hand, she says there are very, very few non-oral documents of this culture, so I have kind of relation to, this cult to, to, to those documents. 
uh, and uh, this mytho mythology, which is Athena here, a Greek mythology, is replaced with the arrival and the kind of a mobile structure of uh, the Roma mythology, one can say. The title of the pavilion, Reenchanting the World, is also inspired by Silvia Federici book, Reenchanting the World, Feminism and the Politics of the Commons, where the author uh, posits recovering of the idea of community and rebuilding relationship with others, including non-human actors, animals, plants, water, or mountains. This non-violent process in which women play an important role reverses the world's current dire fate, shaking off the evil, evil spell that has been cast upon it. So that's how it looks. And then the, the third example is um, a wonderful biennial um, that I had the pleasure of co-curating twice uh, with Ovuldor Muzablu, a Turkish curator that I work, we work a lot together. And I want to tell about this biennial because I learned a lot about Eastern Europe working there. Uh, it's in Prizren, in Kosovo. It's the second uh, city in Kosovo. It's located in the former NATO base. So all this bar actually German NATO base. So all these barracks, all these hangars, till 10 years ago, they have been used by the German army uh, in post-war uh, Kosovo. And then slowly, barrack by barrack, is given to other purposes. So the Autostrada Biennial arrives as a kind of a, you know, also the demilitarization of the mindset. I don't know if we could say the colonization of the mindset, but also the kind of demilitarization of the mindset. So what was the military barrack become a place not of consumption or not of like, uh, you know, um, neoliberal values, but center around what art promises. And um, being in Kosovo, I also realized that when people speak about Europe, they speak, because in Poland we at least think we are Europe, but Europe B. In Kosovo, they, it feels like Europe is really another continent, it's somewhere else. Also because it's the only place that still needs a Schengen visa to go anywhere in the country. But uh, that made me think that on, first, on one hand I'm still in Eastern Europe, although it's very West, you know, it's more West than Austria. Or, um, then it's a, it's a Muslim country predominantly, and it's a country that doesn't consider itself being in Europe. So this kind of also you know, made me think, where, where is it then, if it's not Europe? And I wanted to, uh, yeah, and then, and then we started to think of this condition, and also start, starting, started to think about the idea of a biennial of resistance. I just read a little part um, about this. Among the 300 biennials in the world, there are biennials and biennials. Those second ones, such as our, in our belief, the Autostrada Biennial, are more valuable to look at and work from the critical and curatorial perspective. They have been called Biennials of Resistance by Indian poet and cultural theorist Ranit Hoskote, the same one who recently stepped out from Documenta. And many of them have originated in Global South, such as early Havana Biennial, the Guangzhou Biennial after democratic uprising in South Korea, or short-lived Johannesburg Biennial. Some of their aims were to de-westernize the art canon, the center pathographies, shake legendized institutional art, or create counter-hegemonic models. Autostrada Biennial responds to some of these needs from the position of Western Balkans. Kosovo is among very few countries in Europe where a visa is still needed to travel to the EU. It's a post-war political entity, only partly recognized, a corner where different ethnicities and religions breathe side by side, a Muslim part of Eastern Europe. And finally, it's a place where the language of contemporary art is needed as a form of the militarization through art, as a form of resilience and recovery. And one last thing I wanted to show is this artwork by Ukrainian collective Open Group, which uh, did something very, very simple and yet very powerful, I think. Um, what you see here is a landing, um, helicopter landing field for NATO helicopters on which they drew three maps. Those maps uh, are called 1972, 2022, 1981-2022, 1995-2022. Open Group has drawn the most tragic map so far. Three one-to-one -one floor plans of museums destroyed since 2022, uh, since the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine. As a result of the aggression, 
1,189 cultural sites have been damaged and 40, 446 sites have been destroyed. Open Group invites visitors to enter the obliterated buildings of the National Museum of Literature in Kharkiv region, the Ivankiv Historical Local History Museum in Kiev region, and the Okhritka Municipal Local History Museum in Sami region. This is the legend. This is how you can enter those museums. It's a memory walk amid the three buildings collapsing into each other, a poetic recreation of an ephemeral institutional functionality where entrances and exits, wall and air, past and present coincide. A visitor moves freely inside this big surface where plans are combined with a stretched string, which recalls the beginning of a construction, a forensic visit, or an archaeological excavation on the ruins of destroyed heritage. It is a phantom map in form of a cry, a lament for ruthlessness of the war where cultural archives suffer alongside people. Thank you.